Hello everyone and welcome to Network Playroom. This video is a follow-up to my previous video about the OSPF NSSA external LSA. I want to go back to the same topics I covered before and explain some of the concepts a little better. I kind of rushed through the document and perhaps didn't, ex didn't describe the details in the best way. Anyways, I felt that the subject deserved more focus, which is why I'm making a separate video now. So I've taken a screenshot of the diagram and some of the command line output and moved them to my sketch app so I can draw on them and make it easier to show you everything rather than trying to highlight lines on the web page. So the diagrams and command outputs that I'm about to show you from, are from the Cisco document, understanding the selection of forwarding address in OSPF, which we looked at in my previous video, and I'll reveal them to you in a few moments. But first, this is the mess where we left off last time. I've crammed a lot of text in here, so hopefully we can make some sense of this. But uh, before I get to the forwarding address, I want to go over the various bits in OSPF packets again. I promised to show you the VEB bits in the router LSA, but I forgot to do that in my previous video. But before I get to that, let's recap quickly. So number one, there is the options field, which is present in OSPF hello packets database descriptor packets, and link state advertisements. And the options field enables OSPF to communicate optional capabilities to other OSPF routers. So in the options field, the E bit, which stands for external routing capability, is set when the originating router is capable of accepting AS external LSAs. So we're looking at this field. This is the options field. And the end bit is set when the originating router supports type 7 NSSA external LSAs. And the P or propagate bit is set to inform the NSSA ABR to translate type 7 LSAs into type 5 LSAs. So right here, the ones that I've circled and pointed several arrows at. So these three bits are the most interesting. Let's, let's make this even more crowded. So let me just write that down here. So that is the options field. All right, so then number two, there are those VEB bits in the router LSA. So the V bit, or virtual bit is set when the router is an endpoint of one or more fully adjacent virtual links. The E or external bit is set when the router is an AS boundary router. And the B or border bit is set when the router is an area border router. Now I don't have that on the diagram here, but we'll look at that in the packet capture next. This is the part that I forgot in my previous video. And then number three, there is the E slash N bit in the type 5 and type 7 LSAs. And I'm of course referring to this bit right here that already looks like a complete mess. So I took the liberty of renaming this E bit to the N bit to reflect the metric types accurately. So the E or external metric bit here specifies the type of external metric to be used with this route. And with the type 5 LSA, you'd see either metric, excuse me, <clears throat> metric type E1 or E2 in the routing table. And with type 7 LSA, it would be N1 or N2, which is why I refer to it as the N bit in the case of NSSA external LSAs. So this bit would either be like E1 or E2 for type 5 LSA and then N1 or N2 for type 7 LSA. All right, so now let's 
look at these bits again in a packet capture and <laughs> let's hope I show you all of them uh, this time. So I have, okay, let me go to the type 7 LSA packet capture. So let's open up this link state update so we can get a list of the LSAs in this packet. All right, so here it is. Okay, here you can see the options field with all those different bits that I showed you. And these were the ones that we looked at, the, the N bit and the E bit. So this is why it's so confusing because you have bits with the same name in different fields of OSP, OSPF packets. And now the critical moment where I show you the VEB bits right here. So as you can see here, V, E, B. And then finally, let's look at the type 7 LSA so you can see the external metric type again, which is right here, type 2. Similarly, if we go to this packet capture and look at a type 5 LSA, you can see the external metric type right here. All right, let's go back to the forwarding address now. So let me hide all of these fields. There we go. And then open up the topology and then the first scenario here. All right. So the scenario is that R3 is redistributing the 192.168.20.0/24 network to area 1, which is an NSSA. So oops. Um Let's make another layer so I can draw here. All right. So R3 here is redistributing this network to area one. So let's just put an arrow towards area one. And the selection criteria for the forwarding address is stated on the screen here. So it says, number one, if there is a loopback configured in the area, then the IP address of the loopback is selected as forwarding address. And number two, if the first condition is not met, then the IP address of the first interface on the OSPF interface list is selected as the forwarding address. You can see OSPF interface list by using the show IP OSPF interface brief command. And the interface on top will be the last interface which was attached to OSPF. So I was reading the, this part here. Oh, okay, let me do this. It's not gonna show. That's the thing with layers, you gotta put them in the right place. All right, let me try again. So I was reading this part where it showed you the criteria. So now if we look at the interface list right here, so we can see that there are no loopback addresses configured for OSPF on this router. So uh, the first condition is not met. And that is why OSPF takes the first IP address on this list and makes it the forwarding address, which is what you can see here in this command output. And this one is from 
router 1 and this one's from router 2. So you're looking at the type 7 LSA. You can see that both of them have this IP address 10.143.31.234 which is effectively the IP address on router 3 on the Ethernet 0 slash 2 interface over here. All right. Now, so watch what happens when the configuration of Ethernet 0 slash 0 is reset and it's added back to OSPF. So let me get rid of these first. All right. Let me hide this one, open up this one, and then add a new sketch layer and put it over this one this time so I can draw on it. All right, so what we're doing here, interface 0 slash 0, Ethernet 0 slash 0, so you can see that the default interface configuration is applied. And then the IP address is reconfigured and it's added to OSPF. And you can see that now that is on top of the show IP OSPF interface brief command list. And once again, we can verify that it is the new forwarding address by looking at the type 7 LSAs on router 1 and router 2. So you can see here highlighted that the forwarding address is indeed 10.143.31.234. So it's actually this interface now, Ethernet 0 slash 0. But relying on the IP address of a physical interface is somewhat unreliable and unpredictable as the interface can go down. So it is advisable to have a loopback IP address as the forwarding address. So that's the last scenario that I have here so let me get rid of this again hide it and then reveal this part so see here interface loopback 0 is configured on router 3 it is given the IP address 192.168.3.3 and it is added to OSPF and as you can see R1 and R2 now show 192.168.3.3 as the new forwarding address. There. So I hope this has been informative for you and made the forwarding address a little bit more clear than in my previous video and thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video